Voice in the Wilderness Internet Radio. Enlightening the world every week. It's not just knowing about the doctrine in the Bible. That is not what we stand for here. Streaming powerful biblically based messages live and down the This congregation may never be gathered together again as we see it. Voice in the Wilderness Internet Radio. Enlightening the world every week. Good evening. Welcome to Voice in the Wilderness Internet Radio. We are streaming live on the internet from London. This show is dedicated to God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. On tonight's show, we will discuss the subject, the third angel's message. We will be studying what the Bible teaches. More about our subject after we have had some music. love 
He came not to condemn your life, but to save you from your sin. Voice third angel's message we will discuss this subject tonight with answers from the bible have a pen and paper ready to write down some notes tonight we will be discussing these questions together what does a beast symbolize in bible prophecy who is the beast mentioned in revelation chapter 14 verse 9 what identifying marks are given in the Bible to be certain of this? Why is this beast worshipped? Why is a warning given not to worship this beast? Before we discuss this subject this evening, let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for life this evening and for Voice in the Wilderness Internet Radio, streaming live on the internet from London. Lord, as we study your word, we ask the Holy Spirit to be of us, to teach us and to guide us. For your words of truth is our prayer. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Listeners, if you have your Bibles, let's first read Revelation chapter 14 and verses 9 to 12. That's Revelation chapter 14 and verses 9 to 12. The Bible reads, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, what does a beast symbolize in Bible prophecy? We read in the book of Daniel chapter 7 and verses 17 and 23. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. We read in the book of Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom were full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. The great kingdoms that have ruled the world are presented to the prophet Daniel as beasts of prey. Note that a beast is called he and not she. Thus a distinction is made by Jesus Christ in scripture to show that that a beast is a political kingdom, a state power and not his church which he symbolizes as a woman as we studied in previous radio broadcasts. Now we need to look at why God has symbolized the great kingdoms of this earth as beasts. We read in the book of Daniel chapter 7 verses 2 to 3. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. 
We read in the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and verse 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. In Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15, an angel explained that the waters represent peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Winds are a symbol of strife. The four winds of heaven striving upon the great sea represent the terrible scenes of conquest and revolution by which kingdoms have attained to power. And so a beast in Bible prophecy represents a kingdom that has conquered other peoples by preying upon them through terrible war and strife in order to rule upon this earth. Now who is the beast mentioned in Revelation chapter 14 verse 9? We read in the book of Revelation, chapter 14 and verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead, or in his forehead sorry, or in his hand. In order to find out who the beast is mentioned in the third angel's message, then we need to look at the time of the message, and who the ruling power on the earth is, at the time that the message is given, who preys upon and conquers other people. As we studied in previous radio broadcasts, the second angel's message is given after the first angel's message. As the second angel's message was first historically given in the summer of 1844, and as the third angel's message follows after the second angel's message, then the beast mentioned in the third angel's message has to be the main persecuting political power that rules upon the earth in 1844 and onwards. We read in the book of Daniel chapter 7 and verses 23 to 26, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. We studied in previous radio shows, listeners, that the prophet Daniel was shown that a little horn power was to rise up out of the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which would persecute the saints and think to change God's law. The fourth kingdom upon the earth, the kingdom that historically followed Babylon, Medo-Persia and Greece, was the Roman Empire. The little horn power that arose out of the Roman Empire was the Roman Catholic Church, a kingdom of government ruled by a church and a man which professes to be Christian but is not. In Daniel chapter 7 we see that Daniel was shown that the little horn power, the Roman Catholic Church, will be ruling when the judgment in heaven was set. We studied in previous radio broadcasts that the judgment was set in 1844, basing this fact from the 2,300-year prophecy given to the prophet Daniel, as recorded in Daniel chapter 8 and 9. We studied that the angel Gabriel was sent by God to inform the prophet Daniel that the event which would mark the start of the 2,300-year prophecy would be the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. This event is recorded in the book of Ezra chapter 6 and verse 14. History records that this event happened in the year 457 BC. Counting 2,300 years from 457 BC, we reach down to the year 1844. This was the year that God raised up his servants to give the judgment hour message, exactly as the Bible prophecy has foretold. The papacy was the beast foretold to be empowered by God at the proclamation of the judgment in 1844. Historical events in this world have proven this to be the case. We see here that God's word 
is 100% accurate, listeners. Now, what identifying marks are given in the Bible to be certain of this? We read in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verses 2 to 7, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Before the third angel's message is mentioned in Revelation chapter 14, in the previous chapter, Revelation 13, the Lord gives many identifying marks to the Apostle John to make it clear who he identifies on earth as the beast power. We have not time tonight to go through all the identifying marks given by the Lord, but we will look at some of the ones that we have studied previously. We see in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2 that the dragon, Satan, see Revelation chapter 12, gave the beast his power, his seat and great authority. And so the beast, the papacy, is a power that was set up by the devil and not God. We also see in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5 that for 42 prophetic months, which as we learned is 1260 literal years, a day in Bible prophecy being symbolic of a literal year, for 1260 years this beast power spoke blasphemies against God and his tabernacle. Now what does it mean for a political power to speak blasphemy against God's tabernacle? We read in the book of Acts chapter 6 and verses 13 to 14. And set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. To speak blasphemy against God's tabernacle is to seek to want to destroy God's church and to change God's law. When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God, and in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. That word secular means state power. The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. We will let the late James Albito explain how the papacy has sought to destroy God's church and to change God's law and how it became to be symbolized in Revelation chapter 12 and onwards. The record of the past, when, when we can find out what happened, are so hideous to us that it leaves us weak. But these Jesuits took an oath to take over the Protestant churches, and as rapidly as they could, they, they, they made their way through the Protestant world. The Vatican established a school that in every major campaign and every work of infiltration, another segment of this university was set up for these studies overseas. And in Europe, this is called the Pontifical Gregorian University and it's dedicated to setting up the Roman Catholic Church as a one world system. These uh, institutions of learning spread all over Europe and around the world and the Jesuits had more wealth and more power than any other order had ever had. They were a government within themselves. Here we are again with this book from 1667, The Fiery Jesuits. And I know it's so hard to read the writing from way back then, but I'll try to read it. Uh, 
he says that what we are about to read comes from a Jesuitical creed gathered out of the works of John Baptista Poza, a Spanish Jesuit by Franciscus uh, Royalis, a doctor of Salamanca. So that's where this stuff comes from. And uh, this is one of the quotations in that book. I believe in two gods. One is son, father, and mother, metaphorically, according to a temporal generation, and the other, metaphorically, mother and father, according to a temporal generation. And what is consequent here, too, that the common term mother-father may be equally attributed to both God and the Virgin Mary, as if they were both hermaphrodites. And, of course, this was the esoteric... Uh, view of God, that he was both the male and female principle in one being, and entire houses or temples were set up to worship the God who was bisexual. And this was the origin of homosexuality and lesbianism in the world. It came through the worship of nature and emulating what they believed God was like. But this symbol of a God, both male and female, is no more than the symbol of the devil, and that is what the, the religion of the Jesuits worship. It, now, I'll try to interpret this, too. It says here that, uh, While thus by their shameful credenda, they account the blood of Christ an unholy thing, and do despite under the Spirit of grace. We find no less than 40 years ago, Mr. W. Crashaw, in his book entitled The Jesuit Gospel, did clearly give evidence from their approved writers several other damnable doctrines of the same strain with those forementioned asserted by them this that Mary's milk may be compared with the blood of Christ yea that the merit and virtue of it is more excellent than Christ's blood it's hard to believe that these educated men had these strange bizarre occult beliefs but then when you look at this from their own writings it says, they affirm that the diligence of an expert conjurer in diabolical arts, that theurgy, that's the darkest form of art in witchcraft, using demonic powers, may well be thought worthy a reward. And that a fortune teller is not obliged to restitution if he has consulted the devil, nor to confession, though he hath expressly invocated the devil, and that it is lawful to consult a conjurer. Devil worship was something that was worthy of a reward as far as the Jesuits were concerned. And they worshipped a hermaphroditic deity. And these were the secret doctrines that uh, Ignatius Loyola believed and are taught to the secret initiates into Jesuitism. Many of the Jesuits became the leading occultists in the world, astrologers in the courts of nobles and kings, magicians. In fact, I don't know if you've heard of this man by the name of Mesmer, Mesmerism. Mesmer got his beliefs of hypnotism from studying the work of one of these Jesuit uh, magicians. The Soul Husters by Rennie Norbergen, which can be bought in the book of Bible houses in the States, uh, has an interview with Jean Dixon. And it says, she says, as a child I was taught Chaldean astrology by a wise and wonderful man, a Jesuit priest, Father Henry. I don't see how anyone can say that astrology is wrong. After all, he was a man of God. No, he wasn't, Jean. He was a worshiper of the devil. And you made a big mistake. Jean Dixon, a devout Roman Catholic, is one of the most prominent occultists in the United States. She even does the horoscopes and counsels presidents and very prominent individuals. In the book, Gurry's Doctrine of the Jesuits, this book was written by a French parliamentarian when, they, when he was trying to convince Parliament to give up the, uh, allowing the Jesuits to be involved in education in their country. And so he studied out the kind of teachings that Jesuits received for the confessional. And he discovered some very interesting, interesting things. And this is the uh, decree that Parliament made after they studied his work. It says, these doctrines the consequence of which would destroy natural law, that rule of morality which God himself has implanted in the hearts of men, and consequently would break all the ties of civil society in authorizing theft, lying, perjury, the most criminal impurity, and generally all passions and all crimes, by the teaching of secret compensation, equivocation of mental restrictions, 
of probabilism and philosophical sin, destroy all feelings of humanity among men, and authorizing homicide, parricide, annihilate royal authority, and so on. Through the confessional, they were able to excuse any sin that a man wanted to do. And even today, we see the dangerous results of Roman Catholic philosophy in dealing with sin. This uh, magazine article came out September 1985 as San Diego was ripped apart by, uh, by this uh, situation hitting the news media. The Pope acts on a plea by loyal laymen against homosexual priests. They had tried for years because their children were being seduced, their little boys were being seduced in the confessionals by the priests throughout all of San Diego. And the, the Catholic Church would not listen to them. Finally, they sent their appeal to the Vatican itself and kept hounding on them. But the Vatican went down, and what could they do? The priests themselves controlled what priests came into their district, and they ensured that all of them would be homosexual. So you have a whole segment, and I'm talking about a huge area where all of the priests are homosexual and seducing little children in the confessional. And it's almost impossible to move it. Even the Vatican can't stop it. The facts are that if we were able to unveil the corruption that goes on in the confessional, we'll see one of the most Im Im uh, immoral situations that's ever come before mortal man. But because of the confessional and the psychological, psychoanalytical... Uh, the psychoanalysis ability of the Jesuits, the priests and the rulers would come to them. These men would pour their hearts out before their Jesuit confessor. And these confessors, uh, claiming to keep these things in confidence, were all agents of the Vatican and they sent all information they received from the nobility of the world back to the general. With the result that they knew every secret of state and they could give counsel then in the confessional to direct the whole movement of society. And so, we can see more and more why the Lord Jesus Christ called the Roman Catholic Church the Antichrist. For 1260 years, it had total power to rule, from 538 to 1798, until the Pope was taken prisoner by Napoleon Bonaparte. The papacy was wounded then, but did not die completely. This many people have not understood the papacy still rules the world as a beast, but not openly. It rules secretly through the various ideologies and governments and corporations that it set up in the world after the Pope was taken captive. Now why is this beast worshipped? We read in the book of Revelation chapter 13 verses 3 to 4, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? The Lord makes it plain to us in his word that people worship the dragon which gave power to the beast. We read in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The dragon is the devil, or Satan, the being who was cast out of heaven for rebellion against God's law, who tried to overthrow God's government. The Lord makes us know that those who worship the beast primarily worship Satan. They worship Satan through the systems of government that he has set up in this world. People say who is like unto the beast or able to make war with him because to them there is nothing better or stronger that exists upon this earth. Again, listeners, I appeal to all who are listening this evening. Do you admire Babylon? Do you admire the satanic systems of government in this world? Do you believe that there is more power in sin rather than in righteousness? Do you love to lie, to steal, to commit adultery? Do you love sexual deviance? 
Do you dishonor your parents and just authority? Do you rebel against God's word? Many people even believe that the Bible is old-fashioned and out of date, yet they are turning to teachings and lifestyles that demons and devils promote. These alternative lifestyles give no real lasting happiness and they are inferior to the truth of God and would eventually destroy people. And so why do people worship the beast? The natural, sinful, human heart has no power to overcome the evil desires and passions that strive for the mastery. Satan knows this and tempts the world into sin. But our appeal to you tonight is not to worship evil. To all who are fighting to overcome evil, give your heart to Jesus. He has eternal love and power to save us from all guilt and ruin. There is only one being who humans should worship. Only one being who all human beings should worship. That is God in the person of Jesus Christ the Lord. Let me remind all of our listeners again about who Jesus is. We read in the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is that's living now, and which was, has lived in the past, and which is to come, will live forevermore. The Almighty. Now why is a warning given not to worship this beast? We read in the book of Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 to 10. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. A warning is given by God not to worship the beast because the time is coming when if people Knowing who the beast is, that this beast system of government has been set up by Satan, then, because of their willful choice to rebel against Christ and God, they will receive the wrath of God. This warning is especially applicable to God's church, as all who claim to be Christian, but who knowingly worship a system of religion and government that is anti-Christian, they will be committing the greatest sin. We read in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Listeners, as we continue to study the third angel's message over the next few weeks, which is God's last message of mercy to a world that is guilty of and is dying in sin, we pray that each and every one listening tonight will worship Jesus Christ, and live in obedience to his law and give allegiance to his government rather than to the governments of evil. Let's now have a break and we'll end with a following conclusion. And he 
he finds his pleasure in you. third angel's message quite simply it's calling God's people and all the people on this earth who claim to love Jesus and the whole of the Godhead not to worship the satanic governments of this earth but to worship the true God and to be obedient to his word and his law as we read in the Bible so listeners my prayer for us all this evening is that we would simply give our hearts to Jesus. He has power to save us from all of our sins and all misery. Let us pray now as we conclude the show this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you for life and for your word, Lord, which is the the roadmap that's given to us to guide us through this life and to show us, Lord, who you are and to help us to understand the things that are happening upon this earth. I pray for each and every one listening or who will listen to the recording that they will study your word, study these things that we've been sharing with you, that they would prove your word for themselves and that they would find you as an all-powerful mediator and savior from their sins i pray for all who may be sick tonight for all who may be discouraged for all who may be confused and who are in despair about the events of this world that they would find hope and peace in you and that they would realize, Lord, that you will bring the systems of government and evil on this planet to an end. But Lord, let us pray that we are not brought to an end with the system, because you can only save those who have your spirit and love and power in their hearts, those who will be able to populate the new heaven and earth who are obedient. And so, Lord, we simply pray for these things, and ask for your blessing to be upon us this evening. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Listeners, if you have any questions, or if you'd like more information, please send an email to inquiries at wordlesspublications.org 
You can send a text message to 07944062786. If you live in the United Kingdom, please contact us with your name and address. and We will send you a free bookmark called The Third Angel's Message. If you have the Android app for Voice in the Wilderness Internet Radio, go to the ebook section, then find the title Bible Readings for the Home. At chapter 52, you will find the subject, The Third Angel's Message. This chapter will give you more information about today's topic. You can also listen to and download all of our previous radio show podcasts at https colon forward slash forward slash voice dash in that's i n dash z t h e dash wilderness dot podcast page dot i o forward slash on next week's show we will continue to discuss the subject the third angel's message well that's it for tonight's show until next week good night and god bless voice in the wilderness internet radio enlightening the world every week It's not just knowing about the doctrine in the Bible. That is not what we stand for here. Streaming powerful, biblically-based messages live and down the internet. This congregation may never be gathered together again as we see it. Voice in the Wilderness, Internet Radio. Enlightening the world every week.